So I, I heard that a lot, you know, growing up when I was younger. Of course, once I got into high school, I didn't hear that uh, at all, I didn't think of it. So uh, what's in a name? Now, you and I are called by a name, the name Christian. And in the scriptures, not only we're called Christian, we're called disciples. That means a follower of Christ, Christian, a Christ one, a Christ-like one, a follower of Christ. And uh, the Bible also tells us that we're chosen, that we're beloved, that we're children of God. So we're called by quite a few names. In fact, Paul, on several occasions in the New Testament, calls us saints, that we are the saints. Um, I, I remember growing up in a Catholic uh, religion, and once in a while I'd go to my grandma's house, um, and she, she was a devout Catholic, and she had a calendar and without exaggeration, they had a saint for every day of the year. I mean, literally, Saint Neil, Saint Robert, Saint, uh, how many of you remember Saint Christopher statues on the dashboard? Remember, remember though, remember? Saint Christopher, he was supposed to protect you. He was the patron saint of protection. It didn't work real well for teen drivers, but anyway, uh, apparently he's not a saint anymore, probably because of so many auto accidents, I don't know. But we have a name. But there's another name here in 1 John chapter number 5. Look at me in verse number 4. It says this, For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So there's another name that we go by, and that should be an overcome. We are overcomers. Now, let's pray we'll get started here this morning. Father, help us to be the people of God that overcome our weaknesses, our fears, our concerns. Help us to overcome our laziness, our prayerlessness. Help us to overcome our waste of time. Help us to be diligent. Because, Lord, you don't want us to be the best that we can be. You want us to be like Jesus. And that's far greater than being the best that we can be. So, Lord, help us to be overcomers in whatever it is in our life that keeps us from growing in grace, that keeps us from growing closer to you through your Son, that keeps us from yielding to the Holy Spirit. Lord, whatever it is, help us to rid our lives of it, help us to be an overcomer, to overcome, as, Paul, uh, as John says here, Father, to overcome the world. So, Father, I just pray that for us, your children, and I pray, of course, through Christ, our Savior. Amen. In Revelation, the Bible says this, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, those that were slain. Uh, during this tribulation period. Paul said in Romans, but in all things we're more than what? Conquerors were more than conquerors by him who loved us. And then in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So God wants us to be victorious Christians. So there's no doubt about that. So first of all, notice this. In order to be an overcomer, in order to get rid of the sin in our life, the temptation, uh, the fear factor, whatever is holding us back from growing in grace, the first thing we have to do in order to be an overcomer is to admit to whatever it is that's holding us back. We have to acknowledge what it is. So uh, unless we're willing to humble ourselves and acknowledge, first of all, that we're sinners in need of a Savior will never become Christians. We have to acknowledge before a holy God, Lord, there's no way I can reach you. There's no way that I can possibly stand before you in clear conscience and say, I deserve to be here. So first we become Christians, but obviously, now that we're Christians, and if you're not a Christian here, obviously we encourage you to accept Christ, but we have to acknowledge that which is keeping us back, whatever it might be. You say, well, nothing's keeping me back. Well, then we're just kidding ourselves. There's always something in our life that's keeping us from going to the next level, 
and that is to die to self and to become a follower of Christ. Take up your cross and follow me, is what Jesus said. So we have to acknowledge um, the problem. And all of us have problems, don't we? And we're all confronted with the obstacles. We have an enemy, and he wants to keep us from growing to grace. He wants to keep us from being not just all we can be. That's the world's idea. God wants us to become like Christ. That's greater than what we can be in the flesh. So we have to acknowledge that problem, that difficulty. Um, I was thinking of reading this for the sake of time because it's hot in here, right? After about 12 minutes, people stop listening. Has anybody stopped listening yet? Okay, is anybody lying? <laughs> Um, so what is the problem we have to overcome? Well, according to this verse, one of the things we have to overcome, or one of the things that we're overcomers of, if we allow ourselves to be, and that's the world. So John writes here, for whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. Now, I must say this, that when Jesus calls sinners, he says, come unto me. But once we are saints, once we are Christians, he doesn't say, come unto me. He says, abide in me. And that's the key that we're going to talk about in a second. But here, the world, what is the world? Well, I was thinking of this off the top of my head. The world is Satan and his plans. And Satan has a plan to destroy everything that deals with God to destroy God's people, to destroy God's uh, church, to get the world to worship him. And by the way, it doesn't mean that you're uh, uh, worshiping Satan directly as long as you're not worshiping God. If you're an atheist, you're writing God's plan. If you're worshiping a false religion, you're writing, uh, not God's plan, you're writing Satan's plan. Worshiping a false religion, you're writing Satan's plan. So the world is Satan and his plan. Oh, also the world is sin and the pressures that it brings upon us. How many remember peer pressure? Anybody remember peer pressure? You had it big in high school, peer pressure. You had to, and, you, and people still have it. You know, it's got to be Nathan Burnett. I, I used to say to my mom, Mom, you don't have to buy name brand food products. Now that I'm an adult, I realized, you know, there's some food brands that taste much better than the off brand. So I'm kind of a, it depends on what it is. But I know this, I don't have to have Nike sneakers to wear a pair of sneakers. I don't have to have an Apple Watch. Actually, I don't wear watches, but I don't have to have an Apple Watch. I, I probably could be content with an Android watch. But the point is that there's peer pressure. And there's brand pressure. And who brings that brand pressure onto us? The marketing engineers. The men that work on Fifth Avenue say, how can we suck people in to feeling they have this need that can only be satisfied by our brand? And we all succumb to it. None of us are immune to that. It was Henry Ford. <clears throat> We made the Model T year after year after year. Model T, Model T, Model T. They all looked the same, they all ran the same. They were all cheap and everybody was happy. And then Mr. Chrysler came along and he decided, I'm going to change the body style every year. You know why he did that? So people would become discontented with the same body style. Oh, well, that's the new one. And Ford was forced to begin to change his body styles. Why? Because some people just know the psychological makeup of the human mind. But God says, I came to free you from all of that. I came to give you freedom. Now, it's not wrong to buy a new car. It's not wrong to have certain clothes and certain watches. But if you're bound to those things, like, I know there's kids, because they were in my family, kids, grandkids. They just, they just won't go to school unless 
accustomed to wearing certain brands, which I think is nuts, absolutely nuts, mainly because I was paying for it. <coughs> so what is the world? It's sin. It's pressure. The world is suffering and pain. Anybody ever have any emotional pain in your life? Of course you have. The first time somebody broke up with you in high school, emotional pain. I mean, it's like, unless you married your grade school sweetheart. Did you marry your grade school sweetheart? No. <laughs> One happy person. <laughs> but the world is suffering and pain. We need to overcome that. We can be overcomers. We don't have to succumb to that. Now, I just mentioned a couple of people that passed away today. And of course, there is that pain, but as overcomers, not only do we cry tears of remorse and missing this person that we love or care for, but there should be also a joy in our heart that that person was a Christian. That person's in glory. That person is dancing on the street of gold, if you will, and just saying, if they only knew, we can overcome all this. And then the world, of course, is sensuality and pleasure. The world is that which stands in opposition to God. That's the world. But we are overcomers. We are overcomers. I told you the story once. It's probably not a true story, but I'll tell it again. An older man was walking by the park, and some Little League uh, teams were playing uh, baseball. And so he got up near the fence, and he was watching the game for a few minutes, and a kid sitting on the bench, and he said to the kid, hey, what's the score? The kid said, 18 to nothing. And the guy said, why, you must be discouraged. He goes, I'm not discouraged. We didn't even get up to the bat yet. 18 to nothing, but he's not discouraged. He's an overcomer because he said, when we get up to bat, we're gonna beat him. Now, I don't know the end of that story, but most of us would say 18 to nothing, it's all lost. It's all gone. We'll never be victorious. I just keep getting the same temptation over and over and over again. I keep succumbing to that temptation and falling into sin over and over and over again. And I repent and I ask God to forgive me, but my flesh is weak. How do I get the victory? Well, first of all, you've got to acknowledge whatever it is that you keep falling into, whatever the problem is. Laziness is a big one today. I can't believe how many young people just don't work. They don't work. What's even more shocking is how many men don't work. They're 35 years old living with mom and dad. Can you imagine a grown eagle staying in the nest and the parents coming into the eagle's nest and still bringing food for that eagle? You know what they would do after a while? They'd probably peck that thing to death. They'd say, out, we're getting ready for the next group. Something's radically wrong. Overcoming, know what your problem is and admit it to God. Here's the second thing, and that's that overcomers affirm God's promise. The Bible says here, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. That's a promise. You can overcome the world. You have overcome in one sense. Satan wanted to keep you, the system wanted to keep you from knowing God. And you overcame that. Maybe you grew up in another religion. Maybe you were an atheist. I was an atheist. Into my 20s, my late 20s. But God was graceful, full of grace and mercy, and allowed me to hear the truth. And I responded to the truth. I overcame that. I accepted the truth. I accepted Christ. So, some of you here today need to refocus on the promise. I don't know if you got financial struggles, weaknesses of the flesh, fears, worries, concerns, problems, kids, you got kids, and then your kids become adults, 
And the odd thing about life is no matter how old your kids become, they're still your kids. It's weird. It's weird. Isn't it weird? Yeah. They're in their 40s and you think, I'm a stupid kid. Why does he do this? Why is he doing that? Why is he making that decision? But there are kids. We're concerned about them. First and foremost, that they come to know Christ. And second of all, to live and grow in Christ and to mature in Christ. And that's what we're trying to do as well. I was thinking about Joseph. Joseph was in a dungeon. Did he have a problem? Did God give him the victory? Yeah, he took him out of prison, made him over the entire empire of Egypt. Um, were the Hebrews in slavery in Egypt? Did God deliver them? Yeah. There's people here today, we might be enslaved, enslaved to something, enslaved to weakness, enslaved to, I don't know, the wrong things to look at, enslaved to sin, enslaved to those things that we ought not be enslaved to. He delivered them. David, overwhelmed by guilt of his sin, did God forgive him when he asked him to? Yes. Daniel, in the lion's den, ouch. Did God deliver him? Yes. How many are willing to go to the lion's den today? Of course not. You say, well, that was good for back then, but I don't know about today. Listen, whatever lion's den we're in, God can give us the victory. Jesus was in the tomb. Did God raise him from the dead? Of course he did. Overcomers affirm God's promise. We can get the victory. And then last of all is this. We're going to apply the, um, the Ivy principle. If you want to overcome whatever it is in your life, the Ivy principle, that's found in John, not First John, the Gospel of John. Go to chapter number 15. In the woods behind my house, if any of you need Um, some extra poison ivy. I've got plenty at my house. In fact, uh, it grows along the ground, and then once it reaches a tree, it starts growing up the tree. You know that. It's, a, it's an ivy. And uh, when we first moved in, boy, they, I mean, the poison ivy had, uh, the, you know, the stalk uh, was thick, turned brown, I mean, big, thick. And of course, I got my chemicals out there and I'm spraying all the poison ivy, but when it came to the tree, I can only spray up so far, and so those leaves had died, but of course this thing spread way up into the tree. So I did something that all of you are thinking of right now. You just cut off the ivy at the base of the tree, and guess what happens to all the leaves? They die. Well, Jesus said, in John chapter 15 and verse number one, I am the vine, or the true vine rather, and my father is the husbandman, or the farmer. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, pruning. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you do what? Abide in me. That's the vine for We have to abide in Christ. You say, well, how do we do that? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Number one, we have to keep him as the love of our life. Do you love Jesus more than anything in the world? That's a yes or no. That's what Judge Judy always says. That's a yes or no. You either love Christ more than anything in the world, and I mean anything in the world. You say, well, I love my spouse more than anything in the world. No, you love your spouse more than anything in the world. But when it comes to everything, you better love God first and foremost. What's the first commandment? Not love your job, not love your family. Some people idolize their families become an idol. 
They idolize the family to the point where they're no longer serving Christ. They're no longer uh, surrendering to Christ. No longer saying, Holy Spirit, lead me and direct me. What can I do that will count for all eternity? And the older I get, the more impressed with that thought. Whatever we do in this life counts nothing for eternity. Yes, we're supposed to take care of our family. Yes, you should love your spouse. Yes, you should love your kids. But you should love Christ above and beyond that. Lord, I love my family. Help me to take care of them. And he will, of course. But then he might say, you know, I want you to do something for me. Well, I can't do it because we plan to do something on Sunday morning. And we can't go and worship you. I think worship, public worship, should be a priority in a Christian's life. You say, even in the summer, Pastor, even in the summer. In fact, I believe this, when you go on vacation, you ought to go to church somewhere. For two reasons. Number one, to worship God publicly. Number two, see how they're doing it. Because people always come back to me and say, Pastor, we went to this church and they do this and they do that and they do this. And that's good. That's good. We're not going to do it, but that's good that they do it. So, the, the victory, the overcoming, you say, yeah, I have fear. I'm fearful. We're going to run out of money when we retire. Or uh, I have a fear that I'm going to contract cancer. That's just boring. There's nothing that you need to worry about. Um, all of us are going to pass away someday. And I know how we all want to go, right? We all want to be raptured, right? Or go in our sleep. That's number two. Isn't that number two? You want to... How many want to go over a cliff in your brand new car? <laughs> With your mother-in-law screaming in the back seat. <laughs> the mechanism, the mechanism, if I can use that term, to be an overcomer is to abide in Christ. So keep him as the love of your life. Number two, keep his word by knowing his word. You know, only 20% of Christians read their Bibles regularly. 20% of Christians read their Bible regularly. That's a, a, that, that's a terrible, terrible statistic. We ought to be in the scriptures all the time. You see, Pastor, I read a chapter every day. It's not a question of just reading to read. It's a question of reading to learn. Reading to apply the scriptures. I'm looking at Joyce and Larry. I want everybody to notice that they are wearing matching outfits today. <laughs> How cute is that? How cute is that? Keep his word. And then last of all, keep in touch by prayer. By prayer. As I said, to the sinner he says, come to me. To the Christian, he says, abide in me. So number one, we acknowledge the problem, whatever the problem is, worry, unforgiveness. You know, there's people that won't forgive family members. Can't, you wouldn't believe what they did to me. You won't believe what they said to me. Well, we have to learn how to forgive people. Jesus forgave them when they nailed them to the cross. Father, forgive them. Why? They don't know what they're doing. They're blind. They're blind. We think that unsaved people should think as we do. They don't think like we do. In fact, most people don't even think like I do. They don't think like, they don't see the reality of the spiritual world. They're living in this world only. Sinful thoughts. How many of you have a thought life that's just ungodly? You have to admit it. You have to acknowledge it. Laziness, wasting time, lack of spiritual growth, living in the flesh, unyielding to the Holy Spirit, prayerlessness, problem with anger, lack of self-control, breaking the commandments of God, on and on it goes. Whatever it is that keeps you from getting to the next step, if you will, of growing in grace and maturing in your faith and saying, Lord, use me. 
used me to say, well, pastor, we're old. I'm old. And I'm going to serve God all the days of my life. I don't ever want to quit. Number two, affirm his promises. God gave us a promise. You can have victory. And last of all, abide in him. What's in the name Christian? Everything. We're disciples of Christ. We're the saints of God. We're the called. We're the chosen. We're the children of God. And we are overcomers. Let's pray.